welcome everyone. Thank you all again for coming to one of our online Adulting 101s. Um, mm -hmm. Today we have the awesome Jeff Harrington coming at us from the CSU Chico Career Center. So I'm going to go ahead and um, ask everybody to, if you could go ahead and mute yourself while Jeff is presenting, just so we don't have any background noise. And then if he does ask questions for the audience, just go ahead and type those in the chat function. Thank you all so much. And Jeff, I'm going to hand it off to you. Super. Thanks, Kelsey. So excited to be here uh, from the comfort of my own home. No, not to mention that. It's a super fun piece. Um, so, okay. So today we're talking about a couple of things. Uh, when Kelsey first asked me to talk about Adulting 101, she's like, I, this whole world of COVID and job searching is just changing people's lives right now. So what I thought I'd put together is a conversation about four big things. Uh, our discussion points for today will be completing your profiles. So an online profile, whether that's LinkedIn or that's your Handshake profile, how to just do a basic search for jobs within Handshake. Uh, that's sometimes just getting in, logging in for the first time. It's a little bit overwhelming for a lot of people. And once you get in there, there's 7,000 jobs and you're like, I don't even know where to start. So we're going to walk through that kind of like a live step-by-step. -step. If people have jobs they want to look for, just throw them in the chat function and we can talk about how to search for jobs in different industries. If not, I'll just pull some random ones up. And then the third piece will be Zoom and phone kind of interview etiquette and how to make that experience great if you do get an opportunity to interview uh, via the internet because it's a little bit different than interviewing in person. And then the last piece is just interviewing basics. We're going to talk about how to interview, common interview questions and themes. Um, just if you've never done it before, what, it, what it's like because all this stuff is super daunting. Uh, and so in the Career Center, we do a lot of work with what a lot of people think we do is work exclusively with just resumes, which is kind of true. That's kind of the cornerstone of how we start a lot of conversations, but we expand so much further than that. So like you're seeing today, your resume might just be a the beginning piece of who you are and what you do, but we're going to go really deep into a bunch of different aspects of what career development looks like as a young professional or as an alumni. Um, so let's get started. Your handshake profile. So all, everyone at Chico State has the ability to log into their Chico State portal, and, and we'll look at that in a minute, uh, and log into Handshake with a single sign-on with your username, usually for the Wildcat username or portal, uh, or you can go to straight through it through the Career Center homepage. And we're gonna dive into that in a minute. Uh, but essentially, this, this handshake profile allows you to create a, like a Facebook or a LinkedIn profile of you and your experiences, and it is the, the best part about it is everyone on Handshake, and Handshake is what, if you've never heard of it before, is a job platform for um, all employers and companies and nonprofits and internship creators, all those types of people uh, actively looking for current students or recent alumni. And so different than something like Indeed or LinkedIn where they might be looking for established professionals, Handshake is exclusively looking for students or recent alumni. So for you, building a profile on Handshake can be really, really helpful. So let's look at what a profile might look like. You might have to adjust your screen left and right with all the faces to see all the good stuff on here. But essentially, when you were starting your profile, you'll, you'll get this little piece that it's called a profile builder. And so the first thing I absolutely recommend, because you get somewhere between five and 10 times, per, 10, five to 10 times more likely to be clicked on if you have a profile photo. So um, I'm a big fan of doing authentic profile photos and things that actually look like you. Because so many times you'll have like this one glamour shot and we'll put up a photo from high school and now you're 24 and you look totally different. Um, and I encourage you to find like a, a, an authentic photo. And normally I would say come to the career center and we can take those headshots for you because we have like a LinkedIn photo booth or a handshake photo booth that we set up at career fairs and whatnot but right now we're kind of not on campus. So um, take your best photo, uh, an authentic version of yourself, and toss it up here. So after you have your photo, that's number one. And actually, let me use this little annotate button. As we're here, anytime you see a pencil like that, that'll be the, op the opportunity for you to edit a function. So if you see that on a screen, uh, that's how you're going to edit your photo. So just know that as we go through uh, LinkedIn and Handshake, which is what we're currently doing. So one is up, upload a photo. Number two is going to be add your graduation date. Um, it's, oftentimes this will auto load and usually it's correct. Uh, I finished a master's degree in 2018 from Chico State, which is why that says May 2018. 
and it creepily knows your GPA. Academic nerds, 3.9, yay for us. Um, and if any of that information is wrong, contact us and we can, we can update it. But typically, this information is pulled weekly from PeopleSoft, which is like the master of all things computer database for Chico State, and it auto loads this information for you. So that's done whether you want to put it in or not, which is kind of nice, but you can always hide this information. Right now, I purposely took stuff off so you can see that the, it gives you this profile completion piece. It lets you know, hey, your profile's almost complete, or in my case, it's halfway complete. Um, and the nice part is it'll have you say like, we need you to add your skills or add a document like maybe a resume or a cover letter. Uh, you can add courses that you're in. You can add a profile photo. Uh, what, co complete profiles um, are significantly more likely to be looked at, not only by other students, but primarily by recruiters. And that's what we're looking for, is we're looking for people to actively find you. And you can be really passive about it. You can slowly build your profile so that recruiters, when they're looking for students or looking for people to, as an intern or people for full-time employment, they can find you on purpose, which is what you're trying to get is someone, someone to reach out to you and do as little of the work as possible. That's essentially what the purpose of the profile is. Now I'm gonna encourage you to do a bunch of other stuff as well, but at the most basic level, if you fill out your profile, that's a great thing. Additionally, there's a section called my journey, which is like the about me section. I encourage people to put like, you know, two to three lines up to maybe a paragraph and a half, like tops. Like don't, don't put your whole life story in this my journey piece, but maybe put how you got to where you are, some, um, a big piece about who you are and what you do, what you stand for. If you're trying to go into sustainable world, or if you're trying to go into fashion, if you're trying to go into tech industry, this is where you might toss that in there. Um, and this is where you're going to get to be as creative as you want. I'll show you my LinkedIn summary. It's a little bit snarky, but it's, a, it's definitely me. Um, but you get to play with your level of professionalism and, and what kind of content you want to portray to the world. And if you have some downtime per COVID, this might be a great time to dive into your profile and make it as strong as possible. Um, additionally, this uh, work section, this education section over here on the side is going to be all of your experiences. So that's why it says work and volunteer experiences because a lot of us may not have had a job before especially as a college student. So if you have um, a club you're a part of, an organization you're a part of, if you're involved in a church group, a cave volunteer experience, if you're involved in, um, I'm a barista on campus, or I work at Starbucks, or whatever, you're gonna add this content essentially just like you would as a resume. So my suggestion, even before you do any of this, would be to start on your resume. And we're not talking about resumes today, but if you have your resume done, copy pasting, inserting this content into your profile makes it really, really easy or at least an annotated version of it. Um, and I'll be hyping up, make an appointment with your advisor throughout this whole thing because we can help you with this one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's building your profile with an advisor like this via the internet. Uh, we do phone appointments all the time and we can work on all this stuff together. I'm just kind of going over it loosely uh, so that we can see what it looks like and you can kind of get yourself started. And the second you run into questions, make an appointment because we're doing appointments via the internet for the foreseeable future, which is kind of fun. And then the other piece over on this side, at the very bottom of your page, and I just copy and pasted it over to the right, but at the very bottom of your page on the left-hand side, it'll say your interests. And this piece is like, if you do nothing on your page, fill out this. I think, like I said before, if you do absolutely nothing, you don't want to put a photo, you don't put any effort into your page, just do this. Um, all the, what it's asking for is what kind of job you're looking for, where you want to work, uh, what your interests are, what roles interest you, because what that does is it puts you into like a search category for recruiters. So if you just quick, quickly either type in or use a drop down menu to add in content, like this might take 40 seconds, you are significantly more likely to be looked at by a recruiter just because you'll fall into a category that recruiters can look into. So after you fill out your interests, then you can go back and fill out your profile and really start to delve into the hard content. But I think if you're gonna do nothing, the, the interest piece would be step one, and like I said, you have to scroll down, it's on the left-hand side. And two, it would be put up a photo. After that, everything else is absolutely something I would encourage you to do, but photo and interests are number one. And after that, it's insert your work experience and start to add in your resume and that kind of stuff. Um, if you do add your resume, my personal recommendation would be to take off your email, or not email, your, your, your snail mail, your home address, because people don't need it, and it's gonna be public to a lot of people if you choose to make your profile public. So I wouldn't put my home address or my Chigo address on there. 
Uh, but I would definitely put my email. Um, and if you're comfortable with it, put your phone number because then recruiters can reach out to you. Uh, but it's totally your choice and your level of comfort. Cool. Uh, if people have questions, uh, like Kelsey said before, if you want to throw them into the chat function, you are more than welcome to. Uh, if you don't want to put them in the chat function, that's fine. Just unmute yourself and be like, hey, uh, Jeff, I got a, got a question here. And I'll be happy to answer them. Um, if this was an in-person meeting, I would tell you I'm pretty low-key. So if you just throw a question out there, I'll be fine with it. Okay, LinkedIn profiles. Let's do it. You'll notice that LinkedIn profiles look very similar to Handshake profiles with a lot of similar content. However, the user interface is uh, slightly different. So first and foremost, like we said before, insert a photo. Uh, LinkedIn has a really good analytics thing um, and it runs all this content and you're like 25 times more likely to be looked at by somebody if you have a default photo. For example, Kelsey Simpson, the, our co-host today from AS, if she friended me on LinkedIn and she didn't have a default photo and it just said Kelsey Simpson, I probably wouldn't add her because I think it was some sort of spam or some, some scam person who took over her name and just was trying to get me to friend her. However, if I saw her photo and I clicked on it and subsequent information was correct, then I'll be more likely to, to friend her. So very first and foremost, I always recommend adding a photo. The other fun piece is it allows you to put a little background photo. So uh, let me get my little draw tool out. This whole piece back behind your photo is a really cool way for you to add a personal touch. Um, I put a little too much effort into this background photo. Um, I, I, I'm friends with the university photographer. And so every time I'm at an event, I wave to him. So he has this weird collection of me waving to him at a bunch of different events. Um, which is fun because I can't see any of your reactions. So I'm guessing hopefully some of you were smiling and laughing at me. Um, but my point is, it looks like I'm asking a question. And I always tell people that I'm a professional question asker because I'll ask a ton of questions to make sure I know what's going on before I do something. So as part of my title, which we'll talk about in a second, it says professional question asker. And so that's just part of my, I don't know, unique brand, if you will. Um, but that background photo, what I was gonna get to, could be anything. It could be like a picture of you uh, at Chico State, it could be a picture of a, a cityscape or maybe a city that you want to work in or an industry you want to work in. Or if you're like really into guitars, maybe your background is, is, a, is the inside of a guitar or like a fretboard or something kind of like unique and cool to who you are. Uh, you can use the default, you know, image that, that comes with it. It just looks, I wouldn't say lazy. It just looks un, underdeveloped, I guess would be the right term. So I'd encourage you to put up a photo. Uh, it is a weird set of dimensions. You can Google dimensions of photo and you can crop your own photo to where it fits perfectly. That's what I did. Um, but if you're not tech savvy to pull that off, that's fine. Just make an appointment, like I said before, and we're happy, I'm happy to work you through it. Um, Cause it's a pretty simple process once someone knows what they're doing on at least one of the ends. Let me clear these drawings. Perfect. Something else that's kind of a cool piece is that you can put the city in which you want to be in, not so much the city that you are in. So like right now, when I filled out my profile originally, I might have been in Chico as a student and put Chico, California as my location. However, if you're graduating or if you're on your way to go find a job somewhere else and you want to put that you uh, live or want to be in, let's say, the San Francisco area, you might change that area to San Francisco. And the bit of that puts you in a search function in a different city than Chico. So if recruiters are looking for employees in the area, and you say Chico, California, but you really want to be in Boston or you really want to be in Texas or you're wherever, I might change that area to somewhere else that recruiters can actively look for you, which is a really nice touch, uh, which most people have no idea even exists. Hi, William. Thanks for joining us. Perfect. Hello. Hey. All right, cool. Let's move on. Um, so, okay. So the other piece, like we said before, uh, the, the handshake profile has a section that's very similar to this, essentially an about me section. And so, like I said before, mine's a little snarky. And if I was job searching, I think mine might be a little bit different. But as somebody who works in a career center is constantly sh showing my profile, I spent way too long creating two or three sentences about myself. So my about me section says some people take some cats and dogs. I take in millennials. I help students how to love Mondays as much as they do Fridays. So this is my take on helping students find jobs they like. So when they go into work on Monday, 
they leave Friday just as excited as when they got there on Monday. Hopefully that's a fun thing. So my point with this is that I could say like I'm a career advisor and a 12 year employee at a, you know, a higher education institution and I can, I can go down this route and actively describe what the rest of my profile already says, but I choose to take a slightly different approach, which is giving a little bit something different, a little bit about my personality and then not a lot of paragraphs because most people aren't going to spend the time to read multiple paragraphs about you. They're more likely going to find a fun sentence or two or paragraph that describes your experiences. Um, additionally, uh, in the lower half of your, your LinkedIn, there's gonna be an experience section where you can add in your jobs, your volunteer experiences, positions you've been a part of, and additionally, your education. Uh, I didn't put that in here because if you just scroll down, you'd see these, but they're pretty simple to adjust, and we can look at that live if people have questions at the end, but my hope with showing you this is that you just have some context for what LinkedIn can do and what um, Handshake can do as a student. Uh, one of the biggest things for LinkedIn, and I learned this a long time ago, but I think it's worth noting, is that LinkedIn is like a relationship. Now you get in, you get out of it what you put into it. So if you, if you create a LinkedIn and you don't really do anything in the LinkedIn community, it'll just kind of sit there stagnant. Kind of like if you had a friend, you met them once and you never really talked to them again, your relationship wouldn't go very far. However, if you continue to, to build that relationship or be a part of that relationship um, and invest in it and, and, and be a part of that community, that when you needed something from that community, AKA a job or a connection, people are much more likely to be receptive to that. So for instance, if you are like my profile, I post, I try and post weekly, if not a couple times a week. However, when I'm job searching, I might post even more than that. And the reason for that is that I might post an article. I might like somebody else's article or comment on somebody else's article, or I might write a LinkedIn article, which you all have the opportunity to do. And what that allows you to do is engage within the community of followers, or in this case, they call them connections. And the, and the benefit is that you're relevant on somebody's feed. Like I see the same probably 30 people pop up my feed that are active over and over and over again. So if they ever would reach out, I might, they might be in the forefront of my mind versus a student who hasn't been active or hasn't been participating in this community for a long time, who's now job searching and now wants something, it, I'm less likely to be receptive to that, that need. But don't let that scare you. My point with saying that is that if you want to be invested in LinkedIn or within your handshake community, just start being involved. Like fill out your profile, add a photo, like do some of these fun things. Uh, the last piece that I'd recommend is that you have a public profile. And I, I think I clicked over it, I just didn't talk about it earlier. On the right-hand side, you'll have this little button. Mm, that's supposed to be an arrow. Let's try that again. There we go. You have this little button that says edit, public, or profile, um, and your URL. So your default URL is typically some version of your name and then like 12 numbers. Uh, but my, I, I changed mine when I first learned about this, and it's just LinkedIn forward slash Jeffrey P. Harrington. And you can make it, as long as nobody else has it, you can make it whatever you want, which is kind of a cool function because then you can put that URL on your, your resume. You can talk about it, you can send it in an email to somebody and it looks like it's intentional versus an accidental URL that just, you know, we, we weren't intentional about. So that's kind of our, our hope is to make these as unique and intentional as possible so that you can, it looks like you are, uh, well, it looks like you know what you're doing for lack of a better term. Okay, this is a good time to throw questions in the chat function if you have them. If you want me to look at a live version, I can show you mine. Um, if not, I will just keep hammering through to our next thing. Boom, chat, let's see if there's anything there. What kind of URL? Cool, let me show you. Um, so if I am in, let me go ahead and switch my shared screen really quickly. Boom, can you all see this? Excellent. So if you are in your, if you are in LinkedIn, and typically when you log into LinkedIn, it'll log you into your homepage. And this will just be a feed, just like Facebook or Instagram, and it'll just scroll through whatever's been recently posted. Like I was saying, if you wanna be invested, you might like or comment or share on somebody's stuff. And that makes you more and more relevant because then your, the stuff that you share gets posted to your page and then has an exponential factor to people 
in your community, whether that's five people that you're connected to or 500 plus, depending on who you are. So as you are in your home function, I encourage you to go to your profile, which is this little button at the top, and click View Profile. You can also click on it on the left-hand side, but I'm just gonna do the standard View Profile. And in your profile, this is exactly where that button is, it'll say Edit Public and or uh, Edit Public Profile and or URL. And so the benefit about that is that I can literally just click on it. It brings me to my Edit portion, and you can see my current edited URL. And so if I just type this in, LinkedIn forward slash and Jeffrey B. Harrington, my, it'll bring you right to my page. And my settings on the back end are set to where they're public. So if you, if you can click on me or type my name in, you can see my whole profile. Uh, and that's very intentional. I don't, I don't privatize anything because everything on here is stuff that I would normally tell random strangers, which is kind of the point. Uh, as you can see, it, when you do this URL edit, a lot of the options, I uh, encourage you to click back to LinkedIn because what it'll do is it'll open up a new tab if you're in an edit function. So it, it's a little, looks a little different than a lot, like most edit functions within an application. So just note that you can just click back to LinkedIn and it'll bring you back to the page you were on before uh, instead of using your back arrows. So my point is when you're on your profile, when you're on your profile, anytime you see one of those little pencils, just like you saw in, um, just like you saw in Handshake, um, all these little pencils will give you the opportunity to edit this whole, whole section and edit this whole section and so on and so forth. So I'm going to scroll down just a little bit. And then down here you'll have, um, I have all of my, my current position. So I teach in the college of business. I'm also uh, a career advisor, which is my 90% of my actual job. And it gives you my, my history and what I've done. And this is something we're not going to dive a lot into, but you can add links to stuff. So if anyone is uh, ever lived in university housing uh, and they were there a couple of years ago, I uh, worked in, worked and lived in university housing for five years. And so I was in all of their tour videos as Jeff, the awkward freshman. Yes, you're welcome. Um, so I, I, I put those in there just so that people can see that I'm in, engaged in my community on campus. Um, I have videos that I've posted about like cover letters and events on campus that I've been a part of, keynote, spoke at, whatever, and I just, I put them in there. Additionally, in your education section, you can put in, you can put in the school which you're a part of. And Chico State just recently changed their logo to the Giving Day logo for like the month of April. And so that, that'll, that'll shift based on that. But uh, my point with showing you this is you can add in your education. And then the last piece that I recommend doing is if you have somebody who can endorse you and not just click the endorse button, but actually write you a recommendation, that can go really far. Uh, and I'm trying to see if it's on this. Let me go back to my actual homepage and see if it, uh, you can see it. And if not, I might have just digressed. There's a section at the bottom. Oh, well. Maybe we'll find it in a second. Well, JK, point being, the bottom of the page, there's a little section we can endorse people. Essentially write letters of recommendation, like small paragraphs for another person, which I think is a really nice piece. I've written a handful for students and it says like, Bobby Smith was great at doing this as a student employee. I strongly recommend them. And it's just a nice like outward facing way to recommend people. Uh, and it's no, I don't think it's a bad thing to ask for a recommendation either um, because you can then go like, hey, you know, Professor Blank, can you write me a recommendation for uh, fill in the blank? And it can be a really, really nice way to um, have a testimony about who you are and what you do as a student. Does that make sense? I hope. Cool. Um, perfect. So what I was going to show you, the next piece was how to search for jobs within Handshake. Um, I'm actually going to, let me back up here. I wanna show you where to find this. So if you can make your way to your Chico State Career Center page, on the left-hand side of the page, or like I said before, in your, in your portal, you'll see a Handshake login. And if you click on that, you can log in with your student portal. And we're just on the Chico State Career Center. So you can either Google Chico State Career Center or Chico State, or CSU Chico forward slash uh, careers. 
But as you log in, there we go. If you log in, what you'll see, it'll bring you to your single sign-on. I'm already logged in, but essentially it'll bring you to your portal information. You log in and boom, bring you to the homepage. And this is the section where we're gonna search for jobs. Most students get here and they kind of freak out. And the reason why is because it doesn't feel that I feel like it doesn't feel like it's that intuitive. So a lot of people will look here and they'll say, okay, I've got favorited jobs. I have jobs based on things I might be interested in, which is that section I was saying in your profile, fill out, click on those buttons about what you're interested in and it'll auto filter jobs for you. And I look at all sorts of stuff. So that's why these are a little all over the place because I look with students all the time with, for different types of jobs. There's an on-campus job section. There's jobs that expire soon. And my point with this is you, the, all these jobs are cultivated for you based on what you've done and your past search histories and, and your profiles and your interests or your interests in your profile. But I'm gonna show you how to manually search because I find that way more helpful than relying on somebody else's algorithm. I encourage students to live up in this section on the top of the page. This way you can manually do all the searching that the computer would do for you, but you can actually control everything about it. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear this. <coughs> Before I do that, if you do wanna make an appointment, all you have to do is click on the Career Center button up here in the top right. And once you're in Career Center, so one, click on Career Center, two, click on Appointments. And based on your major, that's a two. Based on your major, uh, you'll get funneled into, uh, like if you're an engineer, you get funneled to Art Cox, who's an engineering uh, major. If you're uh, in the College of Natural Sciences, you'll get funneled into Bettina, or Humanities and Fine Arts, you'll get funneled to Kin. Uh, or if you're in Ag or the College of Communication Education, you'll get funneled to me. Uh, and the nice part is, you don't have to know who your major advisor is, we'll tell you. So all you have to do is click on appointments, and it'll funnel you into schedule an appointment, and you can kind of go from there. So I'll get off my appointment high horse and go back to jobs. But the point is, uh, you're gonna live up here in this upper section because this is where you can manually search for things. And I clicked on jobs, and that's what got us here. Uh, if anybody has a job that they're super passionate about, but they're just like struggling to find, feel free to throw it in the chat function, and we can look for that. Um, otherwise, what I'm going to do, let's see. Okay, cool, questions. Rebecca, I just saw this. For industry, should we put what, uh, what area we want or to put higher education since we are students? I would put what job you want, not higher education. Unless you're looking for a job in higher education, I would absolutely put the industry that you want to work in, not higher education unless you wanna work as a college career advisor or a programmer or whatever that might be. Um, can it be counted as recommendation letters we get the person? Uh... So Harnack asks, can it be counted as recommendation letters that we, we can get in the person, that we can get in person the letters? I think what you were asking was about the recommendation pieces. It, correct me if I'm wrong. But if you're using a recommendation on LinkedIn, it probably won't count as a letter of recommendation. You want to ask for that separately if you need it for something. But if I read that wrong, please let me know. As we're searching for jobs, I'll pull out just a couple, couple pieces. Most people want to dive right into job titles. I usually avoid that to the very, very end. And the reason for that is so that you can search by location first. So like I said, I skip this. I go to location, type a job, and then I will filter well before I even look at stuff. Because right now, if you start to search by what you think is the right search function, and you type in a word, you might not get anything that fits what you think you're looking for. But if you filter by location, you might actually find the job you're looking for. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I typed in, which I would not recommend, but if I typed in something like team building, that's really what I wanted to do. So right now, I see, okay, team building, that's really what I wanna do. There are 1,600 jobs with the words team and building in there. Except for when I go here, none of these jobs are team building coordinators or team building people. They're all words with the word team and building in the search function. So sometimes that search function doesn't get you exactly what you want unless it's something really specific like accountant or civil engineer. But if you're something a little bit more ambiguous, like most every other major, there's only a few that really, really search well by the search function. I recommend searching my location and my type of job. So if we're looking for jobs, I start out with, um, let's do on-campus jobs first. 
Very simply put, if you click on the on-campus filter, it'll literally show you every job that's currently open on campus. And that's, for student employment, one of the biggest things is this, there are four current jobs open on campus. And it's dropped drastically recently because we're not on campus. Uh, so, but any one time, it's usually somewhere between 20 and 40 campus jobs that are up. And all you're doing, which is kind of a nice piece, is you're scrolling through the left-hand side to see all the open positions. And then once you click on them, they open up on the right-hand side. And very simply, if you like a job, I recommend that you start just so you have one starred in your, in your favorited jobs, which is this section over here. And if you start a job and you go back to it, it'll be here in your favorite jobs later. So if you're, if you're scrolling through pages and pages of jobs, you can put like five or six in a bucket and save them to look at later. And all you have to do is click on the apply button. So this position has you apply externally, you add a resume, and then you go to the external application. Some jobs, like the Wellcat Prevention Office, will have you apply here, and then exclusively apply within Handshake, which is a really easy way to add a resume and a cover letter and be done with your application. In a perfect world, that would be it. And pretty commonly, people just do that. Uh, if you wanna take it a step further, I usually recommend that you reach out to that department, email them, normally I'd say stop by their office, call them, and just try and put a face to an application. Good time for a question, let me jump to this. Um, Sierra, you said, will the person who posted the job get a notification that you started the job? Ooh, good question, I don't know that answer. Um, if you follow a job currently, uh, Handshake is just changing this function. If you follow an employer, the employer will be noted that you followed them. If you star a job, traditionally what you get is a reminder from Handshake saying, hey, the job's about to close in a week, the job's about to close in two days, the job closes in five hours. Like it gives you one of those kind of updates. But I don't know if it allows the employer, that's a great question. I, um, I can get back to y'all, I can write that down. Um, I don't know if, if it lets you, if it shows you that. Um, how next? Some jobs don't let you apply on Handshake according to the graduation year. Ah, uh, Harnack, I would say untrue. If, it, if, it, if the position says that you can, uh, if the position's posted, you should be able to apply regardless of what it recommends. It might say preferred graduation year of 2021 or 2022, but it shouldn't allow, it shouldn't stop you from applying. It might give you a recommendation, but it shouldn't stop you. If it does, email us, we can totally by, bypass that. Um, Miriam, you asked where the recording will be afterwards. That's a Great question for Kelsey Simpson. I, I don't know where it'll be. I'm guessing somewhere on the AS page they have a, yeah, is that true? Yeah, it will be posted. It takes about a week for us to get it back up, um, but it'll be through a, it'll be on the AS YouTube channel and then it'll also be posted in through announcements. Perfect, thank you, Kelsey. I had no idea. Um, so, okay, so I just looked at on-campus jobs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clear this filter and let's go look at internships because that's a, that's a big one that students are asking right now. So like I said before, if you look down here, you'll see there are currently 6,990 jobs as of today, seconds ago, that are currently posted. So that's a lot of jobs. Let's look at how many internships out of those total experiences. There are 1,200 of those 1,600, or out of those 6,900 positions that are currently labeled internships. So I like to search by internship and then by city or state. So before I even type in the job title. So I might type in something like, uh, Santa Rosa. So I'm going to type in Santa Rosa, California, and then I'm going to look at a couple important things. One, I was looking at internships. Two, I was looking at my fake hometown of Santa Rosa, and there are 105 jobs right now. And then this is within 50 miles of Santa Rosa. And chances are, if I'm a student, I don't want to do a 50 mile drive. So I'm going to change that 50 mile filter to five miles. So let's do that. So in Santa Rosa, within five miles of internships, once again, an internship within five miles of Santa Rosa, there are two. So if you're from Santa Rosa, just note, there are two and they're at BPM, two current internships in that area. Now, for me, I like to search, like I said, by type of job and by location well before uh, the job title because then you can quickly see if there's even anything in your area and then filter by search, search terms. And that's just kind of a Jeff preference. Uh, but let's just change this, this location to San Francisco. <coughs> right now, within 50 miles in San Francisco, let's change this to five. 
there are 56 internships in San Francisco within five miles of the core of San Francisco that you might be interested in. And I think that's a cool piece is that you can then go, okay, there's 56 jobs. That's maybe three pages of scrolling. And if you're sitting at home looking for jobs, this is a really easy way to scroll through positions. And once you find something you're interested in, let's say it's the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition intern, then once you find this position, then start to look at it. Okay, cool. So right now I can see that this job is currently unpaid. So it's an unpaid internship. It just recently posted. And so now I know, okay, this posted during COVID time. So it's pretty legit. It's, it's still happening probably. Um, it's for this coming summer. <clears throat> and then I can scroll down and read about the position. And I can see, okay, this is what I'm going to learn. Here's the responsibilities of what they're looking for skills and abilities I have to need, and then benefits, blah, blah, okay, cool. Say you're thrilled about this job. Scroll back up to the top. You can start, save it for later, or you can click apply. I always recommend, even though the uh, external application is the last step, attach a resume and cover letter. And the benefit of you doing that is that if people are seeing that people are, if employers are seeing that you're applying through Handshake, they're more likely to post on Handshake, which is great. So it's good for us and it's good for you because the more positions that are posted on here, the more times people apply through Handshake, the, the more validity it gives to the program. And this is a, a nationwide, Handshake's a nationwide application. Like Harvard uses it, Stanford uses it, Berkeley uses it. It's a pretty legit function. Uh, I'm gonna clear this and just do one last search for full-time positions just for any of us that are graduating soon. Uh, let me clear this as well. I'm gonna click on full-time jobs. So out of those 6,900 jobs, 4,800 of them are currently full-time. As you can see, if we're finding another place, let's just say, let's try New York. So people who have posted jobs at Chico State from 50 miles within New York that are full-time, there are 349 jobs, which is kind of a fun things to look and then from here you can go okay I'll look through the 10 pages of, of search functions or you might type in a word like engineering and there are 54 jobs in the New York area that are full-time within 50 miles that are engineering and then that's when I throw in that last search function of what type of job are you looking for and that to me is probably the, the simplest way of searching for positions with Handshake, there are a bunch of other really awesome functions, such as the events tool, you can see upcoming events, you can see other student profiles, you can message a career advisor, you can send messages between friends, and if you're looking to edit your profile, this will be the last thing we look at. <coughs> if you're looking to edit your profile, click on the little, uh, either the logo or your face, depending on if you put it in here. If you click on this, it'll say my profile. You can add your documents, so you can add your resume, you can add a cover letter. You can look at your past applications or current applications. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to live in this My Profile section, which will allow you to live edit your profile. So we've looked at all this already, but I just want to show you where it is. You can scroll down and that's where that your interest section is on the left hand side of the page. And this is just my, my work history because I've overly filled this out. But you can just see all the pieces in Handshake and how they look pretty similar to that of LinkedIn. Okay. I'm gonna go back and switch screen shares so we can continue with this presentation. Hopefully that was helpful. We just did that. Yay, okay, cool. Um, the last couple of pieces that we're gonna talk about today is Zoom etiquette. Um, if you're interviewing, and so we're talking about the last two pieces are Zoom etiquette, interview tips, and then let's talk about interviewing tips. And we do practice interviews with students all the time. Like I said before, if you're interested in doing a practice interview, uh, please do one with us and we can talk about this stuff in great detail and specific to you and your needs. But this is kind of have a general overview of Zoom interview etiquette. Um, let's kick that part off. You all can see this photo on the right of this man's face. One's lit, one's not. The difference is that one, one of these photos is backlit, meaning there's a light source behind him and another one is a light source in front of him. I'm, I'll show you what I'm using right now. I'm using a house lamp. Yay, you can kind of see that right now. Hopefully it doesn't look like the Blair Witch Project uh, as it currently shakes. And I'm also using a light directly above me, like a chandelier of sorts. And the benefit of that, oh, 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 there we go. 
The benefit of that is that you can be front lit and actually be seen. And if you darken your background, I happen to be using a window, but I would, if I were doing this, um, if I was doing this for like an interview, I would probably face the window because it would give me a natural light and I would light, my face would light up significantly more. But as this is my weird home office, uh, I like having my back to the window because I can see the rest of my house. But if I was interviewing, I'd probably flip my, put, put my computer around so that I'm facing that. Big fan of being on time. When it comes to interviewing, you always want to either be early, uh, period. Uh, and if you, if you have to be right on time, fine. But I would encourage you to be early to that. Uh, and like Kelsey was saying, it's a good idea to mute yourself just in general. But if you're the person interviewing, I would recommend you unmute yourself or be really good at using the space bar. So like right Right now, if you're in a Zoom meeting and you hit space bar, go ahead and try it right now. If you just push the space bar button, it should unmute you. Your little unmute icon or your mute icon goes away. And then you can talk, which is kind of a nice weird trick that a lot of people don't know about when they're in Zoom meetings. But if you're in a classroom and you're trying to find your, your button to unmute yourself and it takes 90 seconds to do that, just know that if you're, if you're actively in Zoom, you can hit your space bar and it should unmute you. Two, uh, I recommend having some sort of clean back background. Um, I, I teach a finance class and I see a lot of students' backgrounds. Uh, some of them are more pleasing than others, uh, but especially if you're interviewing, try not to have a wall of beer bottles behind you. Uh, try to not have, I had this the other day, a student with like a half-naked woman on the wall. That's not appropriate. Uh, and two, put pants on. As, as funny as it is to like not dress from the waist down, uh, I was in a student meeting with a student about three days ago and they didn't have pants on when they got up the other day. They obviously weren't wearing pants. Uh, so I encourage people to, to get fully dressed, dress appropriately, find a place with a clean background, whether it's just a, a wall, like Kelsey's using like a closet door. Uh, I'm using a window. Um, you, can use, you can use a bedroom, assuming it's moderately clean. Um, and then if, if you're in a, an interview setting, or if you're in a small, intimate Zoom setting, turn your video on, assuming you have access to a camera. Uh, because there's nothing's worse than four to five people with their camera on and one person with no camera. Um, in a setting like this where we're doing a, like a, a training, totally fine that you don't have your camera on because we don't need to interact that way. Uh, but if you, were, if you were actively interacting with me, I would absolutely encourage you, like if you were in class, I'd say turn your, turn your uh, camera on as well. Let's see. The Zoom tips, like I was saying, make sure you're front lit. That it's, it's so hard when you're, when you're, when you're on zoom and you can't see the person because either they're they're like this and they're too far back and they can't see them or they're in the corner or they're really really close you know try and find that comfort zone where your your head is centered um and you don't have like a triple chin uh due to the camera placement a lot of us are using laptops and so when you're using a laptop it's very common that your laptop is lower and you're looking down at it because you're looking at a table and it creates this like beautiful double chin which i know we all love in our photos, um, I recommend putting your laptop on a couple books. Like try and make yourself eye level with that camera. Uh, and then when you're talking, look at the camera. It is so tempting to look at yourself and smile at yourself because you're so beautiful, right? But the person on the other, and especially if you're interviewing, wants to see you talking to this little tiny camera. So because of that, know that you're talking to the person, they're here, they're not on the screen, wherever that is for you. So look at the camera, uh, make sure Sure, you connect your audio and visual. Um, I'm a big uh, an, uh, a technophile, technophile. What's the word where you like really an audio? Uh, I like technology. And so when it comes to clear audio, uh, I'm a big fan. So if you're using your laptop speakers, totally fine. And your laptop mic, that's fine too. But sometimes they'll pick up ambient noise, like your dog barking. Or if you have children, maybe children in the background, or your doorbell rings, and you can really hear all the extra noises in your house. My recommendation, if you have, like, I'm using, like, iPhone headphones from the mid-thousands because it has a headphone jack. Uh, something like this can be a really helpful piece. If you have a nice headset or just headphones, uh, that can be a really nice piece. AirPods work just fine. Uh, just a nice way to make your, your audio that much clearer. Um, Typically, if you're doing a Zoom interview during the school year and campus is open, we have a handful of practice interview rooms that you can use uh, that are quiet, that are really nice places to use high-speed internet and not have your roommates next to you making noise or 
making inappropriate faces on the other side of the screen, uh, as that we all know can be very distracting. Cool. Y'all ready to move on to interviewing? I hope. Okay. Kelsey, y'all can still see my screen, right? Yeah, Kelsey, you can see my screen? You can still see that piece? Okay, super. Before we start interviewing, my suggestion is to make a list of things that regardless of what the interviewer asks you, you want to talk about. I encourage students all the time to take control of the interview. So after you've done your job search, you've done a little bit of company research about what they're looking for, and you, maybe you get a, an interview and a Zoom interview coming up in a week or two, your goal is to make sure that you know what you want to talk about before you get in that room. Because as an interviewer, I'm going to ask you maybe 10 questions for every half an hour that you're in an interview. And because of that, it's going to feel like I have all the power. However, regardless of what I ask you, you can take your experiences, hopefully, and blend them into the question. So before you get in that room, I encourage people to make a list of 10 skills, experiences, characteristics that are unique to them. And a lot of times I sit with students before we do a practice interview and we start to write stuff out and you might get two or three and you get stuck. So here's my fake list. So stuff like maybe you're in college athletics, maybe you play a college sport, maybe you're an inter intervarsity athlete or you're NCAA Division II athlete or maybe you do intramural sports and that's part of your identity and you wanna talk about that. Or maybe you have a college job you wanna talk about or you're the president or a member of a club or you're an intern or, oh my goodness, if you're bilingual and you don't tell me at some point in your interview, I'm going to be very disappointed. So I encourage you, if you are bilingual, please bring that up. Incorporate that into some part of your narrative during the interview. Put it on your LinkedIn. Put it on your Handshake profile because it's a huge skill that so many jobs say preferred um, and they almost put required now for a lot of positions too. So if you are bilingual, note that. Uh, if you have course projects, if you have stories about conflict or leadership, or things, stories that make you who you are, note them, write them down, put them on a list. Like I literally, like my last interview, I had a, like a four page list of things I wanted to talk about. And I brought a very small annotated version of that literally into the interview with me. And the nice part about that is if you have some sort of portfolio or binder and you have this kind of sitting in front of you, no one's gonna see that list. But at least you can have some quick notes to reference if you feel like you're freezing or choking on a, on a question that might be coming at you. So if you have, which I know you do, a list of skills or characteristics that you want to talk about, make that list before you get in the room. Now you have that list, then you're going to do some employer research. And you can do this either way. They're interchangeable. It doesn't matter which one you do first. But know what type of employer or industry that you're interviewing with. Like know what they do know the departments or services that they offer, know their mission statement, their about us page, their, their goals, if they have a diversity statement or an inclusion statement, have some context for what that is. Um, in the job description of what you're applying to, there's gonna be a list of desired qualities or characteristics or skills. Assumingly, you match most, if not some of those. Talk about those skills. That's what they wanna know is that you, you meet the job requirements. If you are really creepy, like myself, when it comes to doing company research, read the annual reports, read a 10K, if you know what that is. Uh, read news articles or reviews or Yelp reviews or Glassdoor reviews and really just get to know that company. So when you're getting asked a question like, why do you want to work here? You, you have a clear answer. Because if you say, oh, I want to work here because you have cool ping pong tables for lunchtime and uh, you got free cereal bars. Like, that's not what they're looking for. What they're looking for is you to truly know what they do and how you can make a difference or an impact in their environments or in their, their industry as an employer. So make that list, do some research, and then be prepared to be asked infinite interview questions. The answer is no. You won't know what they're going to ask you. However, if you want to prepare, here's 10 categories we're about to go over of interview questions and just take like a screenshot of this once I get, all, get through all 10 questions and they're really good to just kind of study over. We have about 180 questions on our website. And if people are curious, I can show you how to find those list of sample questions. However, as a student, do not practice all of them. <laughs> like you don't have the time or the energy, you'll be exhausted, don't do it. What I recommend students do is do um, practice stories or your list of 10, practice content 
that hits common interview categories. Because one category might have 50 questions from it, but if you have a concept for how you would answer this categorical question, you can pretty much answer and pivot your answer to any one of the questions they ask you. For example, in some, in almost every interview, you're gonna get some version of this question. It's like, what is your professional timeline? It might look like, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Or tell me a little bit about yourself and why you wanna work here. Or can you tell me what led you to apply to this job? Like there's a bunch of versions of this question that you might get, but essentially it's asking for your professional timeline. Like I said before, when you're doing your research, you wanna know why you wanna work there. If you don't know why you wanna work there, maybe you're not ready to work there. And that feels very judgy for me to say. I mean, I'll put it out there. Um, but my point is, if, if you wanna really dive in this and get good at it, practice it. Oh my gosh, I, I wish I practiced this much. Um, knowing what I know now as a mid 30 year old, I did not know this information at the age of 19 or 20 or 21. I didn't take advantage of my career sooner as much as I, as I should have knowing what I know now. So if you know this information, you are steps above most people. Knowing what your skills are, the best fit that job, not just skills, but like the skills that you have the best fit that job that you're applying to. Four is, <clears throat> this one's tough. What I don't want is a weakness that's so detrimental to you doing that job that you're never gonna get the job. Like you can't tell me I really wanna be a teacher but my biggest weakness is that I hate kids. Like you, you can't tell me that. Even if it's true, <laughs> don't tell me that. Because the reason why is because it's detrimental to the job. What you're trying to find is a weakness and not one that you can make into a skill but one that you're actively working on to get better at. This is where you get to show your level of authenticity. If you're not an authentic person, this will be super clear that you made up a fake weakness and that you're not being authentic about it. Uh, if you want to practice these, like I said, come talk with us. We can, we can guide you through your level of authenticity and what that looks like for you. What level of emotional intelligence do you have? How do you solve problems? How do you, um, diversity questions often fall into this category. For instance, you might get a question about like, what is your definition of diversity and inclusion and how do you practice it in your day-to-day -day life? You know, like, ooh, damn right? So what you're trying to do is figure out, like, I want to know, how do, you, how do you solve problems? How do you deal with people who are different than you are? What's your level of emotional intelligence when it comes to solving issues in the workplace? How do you handle conflict? That's a huge one. The conflict comes in all forms and fashions. Um, how do you stay organized? And not like, do you just keep a planner? But if you were to plan an event, or if you were part of a, you know, fill in the blank, whatever industry you're a part of, whether you're in the tech industry, or you're in education, or if you're in some, uh, I don't know, fashion, you probably have planned something. <clears throat> Someone just said, wait, I think the screen might be frozen or maybe it's just my computer. Oh, sorry, Katie, I think it's just your computer. Is it, uh, Kelsey Simpson, can you see the interview questions page? No, I'm currently seeing the Zoom interview etiquette tips. So. Oh, weird. Thank you for telling me that. Let me see if... I thought it was me too, my... <laughs> Camera's been shutting off and on. I don't know if I'm having issues. Can you see that now? Common, yep, common interview category. Okay, thank you for telling me because I would have just kept talking as if you knew what I was talking about. So you're making it. You were asking your question first, then answering it. So it was pretty clear. So you're good. Let, let me go back really quickly because I think what you missed was this fake list of questions. So if you hadn't seen that, that's what I was talking over. If no one saw this, probably is what it sounded like. So just quickly, as you're making a list, thank you, Katie, for saying that. As you were making a list of things to talk about, this is what that list might look like. And you might just create a list of, on a piece of paper of, of skills that you wanna be making sure that everyone knows. So hit print screen on your keyboard and take a screenshot of this so you have it. If not, I think Kelsey can send this out. Uh, but this is, thank you once again, Katie, for sharing this. Uh, to the next screen, that, can you see this one now? The research piece? Excellent, okay, good. So for some reason that froze. Uh, but yes, types of industry experience, um, services, employer mission statements, desired qualifications. This is a really good one to uh, just take another screenshot of and just note of things to do employer research. This interview questions piece that we were just talking about and we were all the way down to question seven, uh, which was how do you stay organized? And like I said, at the end of this, when we get to 10, just take a screenshot or write these down. They're really, I think they're helpful categories to study. Um, our eighth one was, what is your customer service or customer experience approach? How do you solve problems with customers? What does that look like? 
are you someone who's direct and straightforward or are you kind of passive? Do you have an example of a time you've done that? Um, how do you think critically or creatively to solve problems or workplace issues? And lastly, what is your level of leadership experience? Whether that's you in a club or an organization, or maybe that's you um, just being just being a student, like maybe you've been in a really cool club project. Which your point is, these are 10 really good questions or interview categories to study up, because chances are you'll get a question like, how do you handle conflict? But it'll look more like this. Can you give me an example of a problem you've had with a coworker or a supervisor and how you resolved it? Might look like this. Tell me about a time you've had to successfully deal with a client or a coworker who you didn't respect. Might be, tell me about an experience you've had to deal with an upset customer or clients. Might be, tell me about a time or a project you had to make an unpopular decision in the workplace. Our point is, is that your, your category of conflict might be a conflict question, but they can come in a, a multitude of fashions. So if you're looking at practicing sample questions, you could practice 40 sample questions about conflict, or you could really study uh, uh, the, con the concept of conflict and how it maybe pull out some, some examples you have in your experiences that would best solve that question. For example, this is one of our last things. Most times when you're crafting a narrative or an answer to a question, I encourage you to think about it in terms of three pieces. Uh, one, when you're telling a compelling story, and this goes for just about any question, you want to set the scene. Tell me the situation that's currently happening. And then you're gonna identify brief milestones throughout that story of what actions that you took. Not the, the actions that somebody else took or that the group might have tried to do, but what, what did you do? Because I'm hiring you as an employer and I'm not hiring the group. So what did you do to take action? And then lastly, what are the results? What happened? Was it good? Great, tell me about what happened. Well, did it blow up in your face? Great, that's okay too. You can tell that story, assumingly if you can come at it with, here's what I learned, here's how I got better at it. And this, it's kind of a, it's a tough one to, to navigate, but that's why I always recommend make an appointment with one of us, make an appointment with your advisor in the career center, and we can walk you through what that looks like. Uh, when you're in LinkedIn, there's a really cool section on the top where if you click on jobs, whoop, let me go back. You can click on jobs up here. Just kidding. My draw function doesn't want to work. All right, well, let's just assume you can see what my mouse is on the top right of the screen that says jobs. If you clicked on jobs, there's a section underneath more right here where you can click interview prep. And there are 26 questions with the questions and the answers, which is a really cool function um, of how people in LinkedIn are answering questions. And you can provide responses, you can provide your own upload and people give you feedback. It's a really cool function you can use to practice an interview if you don't want to come into the office, but I recommend coming to the office because it's usually one of the best things. So my last piece is that uh, we have a career planning handbook with a lot of this information, just in a different type of format with uh, resume examples, cover letter examples, how to write your skill statements, interview questions, and this is a digital version on our homepage, so if you want to check that out, I recommend it. Uh, and that's me. Uh, if you have questions, I'm totally down to hang out and answer them. Um, otherwise, thanks for coming. Kelsey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. Again, this will be posted on the ASM YouTube channel, so check out, look in announcements for that. We'll have a link posted there for that. Um, we will have a few more adultings. Um, we have one next week and then the two more in April and then one in the first week of May. So please keep an eye out for those. Uh, but any questions, Jeff can still answer those. Thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you for, for your time. Yeah. I just want to, I just want to tell him that thank you for his time and the way he described everything. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Kelsey. You're welcome. For this. Uh, yeah. Thanks. I don't think any questions, Jeff. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank Kelsey, you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. I'll see you soon. Sounds good. Bye. Bye.